Okay, time to get back to a beat that I have not covered in a long time, uh, and that is RAM. Um, we've had a few scares uh, over potential wars with Iran during the time of the Trump administration. I was very critical um, of Trump in those cases uh, because uh, while I will give him credit that he did not go over the line and start a war with Iran, he came pretty darn close a couple of times. Um, and there were some hopes that, you know, because Trump was seen as super hawkish on Iran and that the Biden administration wants to be everything that Trump isn't, um, there might be a bit of a, uh, of a detente with Iran. Um, you know, the, the, tr the Biden folks ran on getting back into the nuclear deal, which really isn't necessary. It was kind of window dressing. Um, but, you know, it's at least a sign that they want to be a little more diplomatic with Iran. And the guy that uh, he picked to be the defense secretary was somebody who, at the time when the when the, uh, the Obama administration started the Yemen war, uh, he was opposed to it because he was working with the Houthis directly, um, sharing intelligence with them so that they could target Al Qaeda in Yemen. And so, you know, things were looking, at least on the Iran front, like they might get marginally better than they were under Trump. Um, because you had this guy, Lloyd Austin, who was an opponent of, of the Yemen war. Maybe he could end the genocide in Yemen. Um, and you also had uh, the overall you know, administration saying, yeah, we want to get back in the Iran deal, because that was seen as a t top achievement of Barack Obama. So you, if you get back in the Iran deal and get ni make nice with Iran, you, know, you could be returning to the Obama era, and that could give people some warm, fuzzy feelings who like Obama, you know, unlike me. But it seems that we're going to get none of that. Um, the, uh, the Biden administration does not seem to be moving towards ending the war in Yemen. In fact, they're not even going to overturn um, this you know, uh, form of sanction that um, Pompeo put on Yemen on his way out the door. Uh, where I think it was he, he declared the Houthis a terrorist organization, which means that all of these NGOs that are sending food to Yemen you know, through the Houthi government um, essentially cannot go anywhere, can't touch the Houthis with a 10-foot pole. And if you can't touch the Houthis with a 10-foot pole, you certainly can't feed them. And so the already starving Yemenis are going to starve even more, uh, and I guess starve quicker. Now, the Biden folks, their response to all this is not just to immediately repeal and overturn this last-minute thing that Pompeo did. They said, oh, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll create a committee uh, to study the matter. Uh, which, you know, whenever governments do that, that's just a way of sweeping an issue under the rug. Um, and even so, you know, in the meantime, people are starving. So uh, not a great start. Does not seem to indicate to me that they're going to do much to get out of Yemen. And now with all this warmongering with Iran, I definitely don't think they're going to do anything about Yemen because uh, getting out of the Yemen war is uh, a, a way, uh, you know, it, even though this is nonsensical to the establishment, that is being soft on Iran because, you know, somehow in their sick, twisted minds, they equate um, starving out the poor people of Yemen, the poorest country in the Middle East, um, literally creating a famine there, bombing uh, their food supply, bombing the grain silos, bombing uh, the flocks of sheep in the field, um, bombing their water treatment facilities, uh, causing a cholera outbreak. Break. Um, that to them is sticking it to Iran because supposedly uh, the faction, which is you know one of the factions in the Yemeni civil war, uh, happens to be I guess since they're enemies of the Saudis that makes them friends with Iran even though to begin with they really didn't have anything to do with Iran. They're not even the same sect of of, uh, of Islam as Iran. They said that oh well the Houthis are Shiites so that must mean they're friends with Iran. It's like, well, no, not really, because they're not Twelvers, and they're, they're kind of their own thing. Um, but, you know, in the meantime, because Iran is the only country that will talk to them, they've gotten kind of close with Iran, but Iran can't get sneak any weapons into them or anything. There have been a bunch of hoaxes where people like Nikki Haley have said, oh my gosh, look, the Houthis, they're firing off Iranian missiles. And it's like, well, no, those were actually North Korean missiles that the old Cold War communist uh, Yemeni government had purchased. Uh, that, you know, the Houthis just found lying around because they control the capital. Um, and, uh, you know, we so so this is where we've been at for, for a few years now. Uh, starve the people of Yemen, bomb them into oblivion because uh, it's too hard to fight a war with Iran. And so now you've got uh, Blinken, who is uh, god-awful, the new Secretary of State. Um, 
he's you know he's just as bad as Mike Pompeo or Hillary Clinton or anybody else who's been the Secretary of State, uh, John Kerry, all the rest of them. He's probably worse than John Kerry even. Blinken decided to trot out the one of the oldest lies you know, of American foreign policy, um, and that is the old Iran is just weeks away from being able to build a nuclear weapon. Uh, that is a line that Bibi Netanyahu, because um, he started it, and then you know the Americans picked it up because a lot of people in Washington are just puppets of Bibi, um, or I shouldn't say puppets, but they're lackeys, they're fanboys, uh, they want to do whatever Bibi says, they love Bibi, um, even left and right. And for longer than I've been alive, Bibi Netanyahu has been saying Iran is just weeks away from being able to to construct a nuclear weapon. Uh, you know, he had his little doomsday clock. He had the little the bomb that was filling up, and it was almost at a hundred percent, almost at a hundred percent. And this has been for my entire life, uh, way back in the '90s when BB was first uh, the prime minister, I believe, is when he started saying this. And obviously, it's been a lie this whole time. And thankfully, a lot of people are pushing back on Blinken for saying this because enough people have heard this lie for the la for over 20 years. And, uh, you know, they're tired of it. And they're saying, no, we don't believe you anymore. Now, if you're curious why this is a lie, um, Iran is not enriching weapons-grade uranium. Iran's uh, nuclear program is only good for energy because they're not enriching their, their uranium up to 90% or higher. They're doing it, like, up to 20%. And 20% enriched uranium, from what I understand, uh, doesn't really work for making a bomb. And that's why, you know, you have IEEA sub, uh, inspectors, Inter International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, those are the people who enforce the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which Iran was already a party to long before the Iran deal. They'd signed it for, you know, tech, for however long ago. Um, they go in and they inspect nuclear facilities all around the world to make sure that uh, the countries who, you know, sign this treaty are not using, are not enriching uranium enough uh, to the point where they can make a bomb with it. And so no matter how much uranium, enriched uranium, they have stockpiled, uh, it doesn't matter. Even if they have enough quantity-wise to make a bomb, they don't have uh, the quality of uranium that you need to make a bomb. And so again, unless uh, there's some nuclear physicist who can tell me that you know you can somehow build a nuclear bomb with 20% enriched uranium, which according to the IAEA, I don't think that's possible, or else the IAEA would be coming in and saying to Iran, you know, hey, you're in violation of the treaty, um, then, you know, there's no problem here, and it's all a lie. Now, do I think that this is the Biden administration trying to start a war with Iran? Um, I should hope not. Um, I would have thought that if anybody was going to do that, it might have been Trump, since Trump ran on being the biggest Iran hawk ever, uh, and how much he loved Israel, um, you know, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, but uh, in his administration, you know, in the eight times of his administration, uh, you know, the wars that he amped up, you know, were more, I guess, to the benefit of Saudi Arabia than Israel, interestingly enough. He made other concessions to Israel, like, you know, moving the embassy, which is a symbolic gesture, and, uh, you know, at least as far as I'm concerned, I don't care what the stupid U.S. embassy is, um, uh, but uh, kind of recognizing the settlements a little bit more and saying, you know, okay, Israel basically owns the West Bank and, and stuff like that. And while Trump did assassinate Soleimani and um, create a whole bunch of tension between the U.S. and Iran for a time, he did not step over the line and invade Iran. And I think that the reason for that is that uh, the U.S. military, um, you know, no, ma no, no matter who is in charge, understands that a war with Iran would not be fun, it would not be easy, and it would not be over quickly like, say, the, the war against the Iraqi government was. Now, the Iraq war carried on for a very long time, and that's because after the government was defeated, there was a, an insurgency against the U.S. occupation. Uh, Iraqi people who hated being occupied by the American military. Um, that was why the, the Iraq war dragged on so long. But, you know, defeating the Iraqi government was easy. They just marched to Baghdad and they were there and they said, okay, we're in charge now. Uh, Saddam, you gotta go. And he was gone. Iran is a very vast country. They have a much bigger military um, and they are mountainous. And so it'll be a long trek to Tehran. Uh, Tehran is pretty far uh, from uh, the Gulf. Uh, once the U.S. starts landing there, they're going to have to march across, you know, very rugged terrain, and it's, you know, it's going to be a long slide. There's a lot of, um, you know, there are a lot of cliffs, 
which the Iranians, you know, could sit up on and shoot down at the Americans as they're climbing over and, and stuff like that. And, of course, eventually the U.S. would win, but they'd have, you know, quite a few casualties, and it would take a little while. Um, so I don't think that, you know, anyone's interested in that kind of a war these days. And so, as Gareth Porter puts it, uh, the, the Biden folks are just tr kind of trying to boss the Iranians around and make them feel small. Uh, that's more what their goal is here. They look at the Iranians as weak people who, if they slap them around a little bit, they will just do as they say. And if so, that means that their belligerency won't really go anywhere. Now, will it be productive? No. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't think that they're going to bait the Iranians into doing anything ridiculous. I think that the Iranians kind of see, uh, you know, what they're doing, kind of in the same way that the Iranians, you know, they go out there and they shout death to America at their big rallies. And they go, we're going to we're going to kill all the the Jews in Israel and we're going to kill all the Americans and Iran will be the king emperor or, or the biggest uh, pow world power. We're going to rule the world. I don't think they actually say that, but I mean, they, they say some pretty provocative things at, at their rallies, which, you know, is why people, you know, in Israel and the U.S., you know, like to like to hate Iran. And, you know, it's not like there's no reason. And so the Iranians understand that, uh, you know, the U.S. administration, uh, whoever it is, is going to talk tough about them and not be nice to them, to you know, in public. They're not dumb enough to go firing off missiles at the U.S. because Blinken uh, is being uh, obtuse and is repeating, you know, an old Israeli lie. And so what this looks like to me uh, more, most likely is, is gridlock. Um, you know, I guess the, the, the sanctions from the Trump era are probably going to stay uh, – they're going to stay in place until the Iranians say uncle. Uh, and they say, oh, gee, please, Mr. Biden, I'll do whatever you say. Um, just, you know, uh, stop, uh, you know, stop uh, twisting my arm. And so I guess the word that I would use to describe uh, what I expect the Biden foreign policy to be based on what we've seen in these first couple of weeks is uh, stagnation. Um, Biden is not going to pull out of anywhere, but he probably won't invade, you know, anywhere meaningful, meaningfully. Um, any new places, you know, again, every administration likes to find some little tiny country that they can go, uh, you know, uh, push down, you know, onto the ground and kick some dirt in their face um, just so they can look like a big tough bully. Um, many, uh, many Americans have articulated that they, they think that the, the, the U.S. got, you know, the U.S. military should do that every few years just to remind the world that we're big and tough and we're the tough guys. Reagan had Grenada, um, Bush Sr. had Kuwait, uh, and, well, W went a little overboard because he used 9-11 uh, as an excuse to invade Afghanistan and Iraq, even though neither of those countries had anything to do with 9-11. Clinton, of course, had Serbia. Um, every president likes to find these. Uh, oh, and I, how could I also forget... Uh, um, Honduras, I believe, was also under Clinton, and you had Panama under Bush Sr. So Bush Sr. had a couple of, you know, had a couple of little wars. But other than that, I think that Biden will remain bogged down in probably all the same conflicts that were already involved. There's going to be no progress made anywhere. There's going to be no peace in Afghanistan. Uh, there's going to be no peace with Iran. Uh, there's going to be no stepping away from Saudi Arabia and Israel and, you know, <clears throat> putting uh, putting our own country first. Certainly, no, America first is racism. Um, you know, we all know that the most woke thing on the earth is siding with Saudi Arabia and Israel. And so the American empire, I think, is going to atrophy and decay. Um, there's nothing, you know, the, the U.S. is not certainly not going to be stronger after the next four years. I think that probably all these wars that we're witnessing are going to go on until the U.S. collapses for good. Um, kind of like the Soviet war in Afghanistan, you know, just bled them dry. Um, I don't think that the wars will be what pushed the U.S. over the edge, but they're certainly not going to help. And when the final collapse of the United States occurs, um, you know, then these troops will finally be withdrawn. Then, you know, there will stop being so much uh, saber rattling with Iran. Then there will be so much, you know, they'll stop defending the interests of Saudi Arabia and Israel um, because there will be no more resources left. The U.S. will just simply not be able to at that point. But uh, the, the strength, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, bureaucratic inertia, as we saw under Trump, um, is strong, and I don't think that it's going to be overturned in any meaningful way. 
But because of that, because the U.S. is bogged down in all these different places, uh, because its resources are spread so thin, uh, the U.S. military is not strong enough, I don't think, to meaningfully wage you know, uh, another big war. We're not going to have an, a, a, a World War II scenario or even a Vietnam or something like that, probably um, for the foreseeable future. And so that's about a, uh, that's about all I have to say for today on this matter. Uh, if you gain anything of value out of this video, I'd appreciate you clicking that like button and sharing this video. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe because I do upload every day and I take to have you miss one. So I'll see you folks back here tomorrow.